Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I'm very pleased that he could come up and join us. Um, he's incredibly busy doing many lectures um, and ha wears many different hats. He's a professor and researcher at UCLA at the Center for the Culture, Brain, and Development, um, has done fascinating research in neurobiology um, that uh, he presents both to lay people and to practitioners. He's doing a talk tonight at the Intamon Theater um, on child brain development and is actually also doing a practitioner two-day um, service at the Seattle Center later this week. So if you'd like to chat with either I or him about that, I can get you more information on that. Um, I'm so pleased that he could come up and talk to us a little bit about neurobiology. Um, he's done fascinating work on the brain as a system and I think this is very interesting work for us as we start to look at how to create new UIs and new OSs. Um, so. Please help me welcome Dan Siegel. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, can you hear okay? Yeah. Good. Well, I'd like to thank uh, the people at Microsoft for bringing me here, and especially John Sable for his support and encouragement and uh, uh, connection to uh, getting uh, the opportunity to meet with you. Um, earlier, we had a chance to meet in the research division, had a lot of fun going over some issues about interface and about the brain. And so what I'd like to do uh, in this hour and a half or so that we have is introduce you to a way of thinking about our minds and our brains and our experience uh, that can be called interpersonal neurobiology. It's a phrase that refers to basically looking at a broad range of sciences to understand the human experience, both in terms of development and in terms of our here and now uh, moment to moment living. So let me just ask in the audience, how many of you are familiar with the way the brain helps shape the mind? Okay, so this is, so one person, so this is a, good. So can you help me come teach this today? <laughs> no. Uh, so this is kind of going to be the subject that we're talking about. And, and it's always good for me to get a feeling for where you're at because there's so many new and exciting things about the brain and about how it gives rise to the mind, for example, or how it influences our relationships with each other, with technology, uh, that we want to make sure we're all able to understand the, the basic concepts and then move forward into the uh, deeper issues. So first, let's start with um, a picture of the brain. Actually, what I'm going to do, and I think you have this on the, um, in your, it's available to you if you want to get this in the future, but. Let's just go to uh, this picture here of the brain and do this. This is uh, a picture of the human brain. And this brain here has uh, basic cells in it called neurons, which have connections to them. And the most important thing uh, to start out with is to say that when we talk about the mind and how the brain gives rise to the mind, we really need to focus on the way these 100 billion neurons connect with each other. And so when you're going to hear the word connection over and over again. And that's going to be a crucial point because connections in the brain among these 100 billion neurons determine the way the structure, of course, is. These, this is the way brain structure is, is created, is by connections among 100, 100 billion neurons. But the structure of the brain determines directly its function. Right? So just to start with the most crucial principle is that when you change structure, you change function. Right? So let me give you an example. Um, when the baby is first born, this brain has a lot of neurons. It has, actually has about as many as it will always have. In fact, sometimes people think of a little more. Uh, but there aren't that many connections among them. So if I'm an average neuron, how many connections will I make at, at a junction called a synapse? How many synaptic connections will I make as an average neuron to other neurons? Any idea? Thousands. Thousands is a good guess. It's actually 10,000. So you guys are here at Microsoft. 
How many connections then are there in the brain? If the average neuron is 10,000 connections, there are 100 billion neurons, then there are a lot. A lot. Good. <laughs> That's very good. So there are a lot of connections, over 100 trillion connections, right? And we're going to review each one of them because I was given a little extra time. <laughs> so uh, awesome. if you're ready. <laughs> so now, of course, this could be overwhelming, and it could make you nutty to try to go into it, which is why they call people neurotic, OK? <laughs> It's a very complicated system, but the good news is there, there are some fundamental principles that allow us to understand how this complex system operates. And so I'm going to try to give to you the take-home messages. And then if you're interested, of course, you can read some more. I have a, a book called The Developing Mind, which kind of goes over the basics. This parenting book is for parents to understand this stuff. But there's a whole series of books I, I edit through Norton which reviews this in detail. We have thousands and thousands of, of scientific references, but it's to try to distill the research into usable packets of information. That's what this is all about, this interpersonal neurobiology approach. So let's just go over some very basic things. The connections among these neurons are important because the way neurons act, their activation, when we say neurons are firing, means that along a long cell, if I'm an axon, I'm going to have this long, long uh, length called, uh, of my cell, my neuron, called an axon. And it reaches out to the end of another one. Do you want to be another neuron? Sure. So come on up. So here's two neurons connecting to each other. Now my axon reaches out at a synaptic level, but we never touch. OK, there's a space here. And that junction is called a synapse. synapse. Good. See, this is. Since we know how the brain works, if I don't get you to be active, you won't remember. OK? So this is what we're going to do here. So that's a synaptic junction, a synaptic cleft, a synapse, OK? Now, the deal is this. When this axon, when the membrane of my axon has a depolarization, that is, electrons are essentially flowing down the length. Actually, ions are flowing in and out. But it's like an electrical current, the equivalent of it. When it gets to the end, I'm going to release a neurotransmitter which will be either activating or deactivating at the postsynaptic, you see, neuron. And, and here, this is either the dendrite of the receiving neuron, called the postsynaptic neuron, or it's at the cell body. It's not at the axon, OK? Then, if there are enough activating neurotransmitters released versus inhibitory ones, then the electrical current will flow down here past the cell body where the nucleus is, and then put up your other arm, go down here. And if I'm the next neuron, then we do the same thing here. Now remember, there are 10,000 connections. So you know when you go to dinner and you don't know who to talk to? If you have one person by each side, think about being a neuron. You've got 10,000 people or, or elements to connect to. Thank you very much. Let's hear it for our fellow neuron. Very good. So when we talk about neural firing, that's ultimately what we mean is the activation of a neuron, the transmission of this electrical current down the axonal length, the release of neurotransmitter inhibitory and, activa uh, and, and activating. And the summation of that will be determined by the number of receptors, the kind of receptors at the receiving end. OK, and I've got a, someone who's maybe can change my, um, rather than me do it. Someone want to run up here? You probably are familiar with uh, XP. <laughs> I had to get to my. Uh, <laughs> this will be fun. You can only do this at Microsoft. Let's just change the, the, you know, the turn off. It's like at two minutes to an hour or something. Um, so the, the, the deal here is that when we say neural firing, what we mean is that what just happened there. At least two neurons got activated. That means neural firing. Okay? Now, why am I bothering telling you about neural firing? Well, I'm going to show you a little film clip in just a moment that can help you understand the feeling of neural firing. And then we're going to go into the details of the science of it. Because it's always important to know what it means for you as an individual, for you as a person. And we'll do that. Look at that. You're getting a look at There we go. Thank you so much. That's great. Um, OK. So we'll go back to our other brain. So what I'm going to do now is just show you a clip. And I, what I want you to do is just experience this. And this is actually uh, I've borrowed from uh, some other Washingtonians in Spokane, wonderful guys called the, who are part of what's called the Mary Cliff Institute. They actually use this as part of a parenting intervention program. I actually use it to show how the brain works. And it's been fun to work with them, and they're very kind to lend it to me. So this is from the Mary Cliff Institute. And what I'd like you to do is just sit back, 
relax, and it'll be two phases, and just notice what the experience is like. Okay. How many of you noticed the difference between one and two? <laughs> okay. Great. Um, what was the difference? How did you feel on the first one? Relaxed. Relaxed. Okay. Tranquil. Tranquil. The second one was, hot, was anxiety, tense, apprehension. Anxiety, tense, and you were? Apprehensive. Apprehensive. Great. Okay. And that, did a lot of you share those different feelings? No. Great. Now, the visual on that was identical, just so you know. But the music, obviously, was very different. Now, how does that happen in the brain? How do you have such a profoundly different experience with the same visual input from different auditory input? Now, we don't know the exact answer yet, but we do know a little bit that in the brain, you have at least three different areas that we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about the neural firing in these areas so you can get a feeling of how neural firing creates your own experience of being alive, okay? And the three areas are, in this first region here, is the brain stem. This is the oldest area of our brain. It comes up from the spinal cord in our bodies. And this is the part of the brain that's sometimes called the old reptilian brain. And the important point for today's talk is that in this part of the brain, you have survival reflexes of fight, flight, and freeze how you keep yourself alive in the face of threat. Okay, that's the brain stem. And then as we developed into mammals, we developed the middle part of the brain here, which are called limbic structures, which actually create emotion. They appraise the meaning of events, and they're also involved in social relatedness. So meaning is created in these areas, emotion is created in these areas, and relatedness is created in these limbic areas. One of the most studied part of the limbic circuitry parts is called the amygdala, which is right here. And this is a part of the brain that actually can generate a state of fear. OK, so just to get a little more close at it. So what we're talking about is basically a brain stem area with these survival, fight, flight, freeze responses. This middle zone are the limbic structures, second area, with the amygdala being one of them. There it is, the amygdala. And then what we've developed then, also as mammals, but especially as primates, is a very enlarged cortex, this third area of the brain, which allows us to think abstractly uh, and to reason. And in the cortex, essentially what you have, the posterior areas of the cortex are basically for perception. Okay, both side and posterior. So, for example, when you're watching something like the scene of walking to the Oregon coast, we know that the posterior part of your cortex, the visual cortex, is active. 
So just to pause there for a moment, let me just translate that. What we know is that neural firing, that is, you know, electrical current down the axon length, release of neurotransmitter, this downstream neuron fires, that's neural firing. When that stuff is going on here, you have the subjective experience of seeing something, right? So visualization, both when you're receiving things from your eyes directly, when you're seeing something, as well as when you imagine something visually, actually activate the same part of the brain, and that's encoded here and processed in the activation of the visual cortex. Now let me take a, give you a third take home point here as we're walking through very slowly through this. No one on the planet who's announced anything uh, knows how subjective cognitive or, uh, or subjective experience rides on these neural activity, a activations. We don't know that. No scientist, Nobel Prize winner or not, can tell you how the physical act of electrical activation and energy and the release of chemicals leads to the subjective experience of seeing that walk down to the Oregon coast. Nobody knows. No matter how many books they've written or lectures they've given, nobody knows. Now, the good news about that is there's a lot to learn. The frustrating thing for that is for some people, they say, well, if we don't know that, why even look to the brain? Because we don't know how the brain gives rise to the mind. So before I go through the rest of the cortex, let me just take a pause here and say that even though we don't know that, we know enough how to define the mind and define the brain, and they're not the same. Mind and brain are not the same. But they have a deep, deeply interwoven relationship with each other. So the brain, we're saying, includes these neural structures and other structures in the skull. It's intimately influenced by the body and the social environment and, in fact, the whole world. So it's a part of a larger system, but we're defining this part of the system as the brain. The mind can be defined as the flow of energy and information. So like right now, among us, we are creating a, a mental experience. You could say, well, it's between your brain and mine, and that's fine. But the point is, the mind is much more than what's happening in the skull. So when you look at a lot of recent writings that are all excited about PET scans and functional MRIs about the brain and say, we're seeing the mind, it's really not true. It's an oversimplification. The mind is more complex than just the idea of activation in a skull. It's helpful, but it's not the whole picture. So that's a very important issue, that the flow of energy and information that defines the mind is broader than just what goes on inside of a skull. Nevertheless, it's helpful, as you'll see in a moment, to go through this. So we have the idea that activation of neurons somehow is linked to mental experience. Posterior areas are for perception. At this point, you have the frontal lobe beginning. And in this area, you have the motor cortex that creates motor action. And in front of that, you have the premotor area, which plans for motor action. And in front of that, you have the prefrontal cortex, which is huge in human beings. And the whole frontal area is enlarged in primates. Front prefrontal area here is especially large in us. And this is the area that allows us to plan. And there are two major aspects of this. One you can't see on this slide is the side area. And in fact, if we, we'll do a little hand model. This is in all my books. And my daughter actually drew the picture in the parenting book. If you put your thumb in the middle and put your fingers over, this is actually a pretty good uh, imitation model, 3D model you have. So here you see the, the brain stem would be in the middle of your palm there. The thumb would represent, you should have two thumbs. Most of us should have one. You'd have the limbic structures here. And then the cortex you see folds itself over. So just taking a frontal view then, the face of your person would be here. Your prefrontal region, the frontal cortex would be represented by these second to last knuckles down. Your prefrontal cortex would be your last knuckles down. And it's divided pretty much into two major areas. The side area is when you focus attention. Studies show that when you put something on the, in the front of your mind, you're always activating this, it's called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, this side area, these two outer fingers. Okay, so whenever you say to someone, okay, focus on the screen of your computer and pay attention to that, we know that you're activating this area and you're gonna link the activation of your side part of your prefrontal cortex with whatever you're asking them to pay attention to. If it's a sound, it'll be the side part of their brain. If it's a sight, 
it'll be the posterior part of the brain. So linking the dorsal lateral with whatever other area is activated gives you consciousness. Present time consciousness. Everybody with me on that? The middle area is actually very different and it consists of at least three different components that we'll just mention because they're very relevant, I think, for user interface issues. The first part of the middle part of the prefrontal cortex is called the orbital frontal area. And it very much is a part of a system that links to this area just here, which is called the anterior cingulate. And these you'll probably see in different things in the New York Times and stuff, so I'm just mentioning them. Orbital frontal cortex behind the orbit of the eyes. Anterior cingulate, this is called the cingulate cortex and it's anterior, so that's why it's called anterior cingulate. And then here is called, this is called the medial prefrontal area. There's a ventral medial prefrontal and dorsal medial, but the bottom line is the whole thing is called the medial prefrontal area. These carry out different functions, but in general, the three of them work together in a very unique way to produce very important functions, which I'll mention to you in just a second. But the orbital frontal, the anterior cingulate, and the medial prefrontal when I use the term the middle prefrontal, it's not a scientific term, but that just embraces all three areas. So let me just give you the list that is quite astonishing, and I'm gonna show you uh, how it works in just a moment. But the middle aspect of the prefrontal cortex, when I've gone to the basic brain research literature, does nine functions. And when I say the phrase, it does nine function, it means if you put a bullet there, it destroys it. And I have a patient like that, and I, I can tell you what that's like and what that looks like when someone survives that. If you put a railroad spike, it destroys it. And that was the book you may know about uh, by Damasio called uh, Descartes' Error, uh, Phineas Gage from 100 years ago. If you get a tumor there, it destroys these functions. If you get a stroke there, it destroys these functions, etc. So that's from pathology. We also know now with functional MRIs that when you ask the subject to do certain things, this part of the brain is lit up when some of these ones on the list are there. So from either pathology or normal functioning now that we have scanners, you can tell that this area is crucial for it. It doesn't do it alone, as you'll see, but it's crucial for it. Here's the nine functions of the middle aspect of the prefrontal cortex. It keeps the body regulated. And for those of you who remember uh, brain-body uh, brain interactions, you have an autonomic nervous system which has two branches to it, an activating branch called the sympathetic branch, a deactivating branch, which is like the brakes, called the parasympathetic branch. These ultimately end up in the middle aspect of the prefrontal cortex, which basically acts like a clutch, balancing the brakes and the accelerator of the body. So it controls the gut, the lungs, the heart. Keeps that in balance. That's number one. Number two is attuned communication. When you look at someone in the eye and you feel like you're getting a connection going, like between a baby and a, a mother, the middle aspect of the prefrontal cortex lights up, primarily the orbital frontal region, but also the anterior cingulate. That's number two. Number three is when you have uh, your emotions in balance, we know this area of the brain actually sends inhibitory fibers down to the limbic circuits to keep them in balance. Number four is something I call response flexibility, which means when you're in a pattern of carrying out a certain act, and the stimulus changes, and you need to pause before action and choose a flexible response, this is the area that's involved. So response flexibility. Number five is empathy, or what I call mind sight. Being able to put yourself in the mental position of someone else requires an intact area. In fact, there's something called the default mode, where this region of the brain seems to be constantly scanning the environment to figure out what's going on inside of someone else. It's an astonishing finding that's part of what are co what's called theory of mind. That is that the brain is constantly creating a picture of someone else's mind. So in my next book called Mindsight, I explore what this means for our daily life and what happens when children don't have the opportunity to actually be spending time face to face with other kids and other adults, but instead they're spending it with inanimate objects, what that means for the development of this area of the brain. That's mind sight, number five. Number six, if that wasn't enough, is self-knowing awareness, what a fellow named Endel Tolving calls auto-noetic or self-knowing consciousness or awareness. Auto-noetic consciousness uh, involves this region of the brain and it allows the brain to do something called mental time travel or link 
representations of the past with the experience in the present and anticipation of the future. That's called mental time travel. Involves this area of the brain too. That's number six. Number seven is fear extinction. When you get frightened of something and you've learned to be afraid of, let's say, a dog, uh, we now know first from studies of rats, not with dogs, but with shock experiments, and now recently in humans in some unpublished data, this area of the brain actually sends those GABA fibers, the gamma aminobutyric acid is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, to the amygdala that encodes fear, and it tells it to calm down. And literally, it keeps fear checked. So that if you do something to damage this area, either permanently or temporarily, fear is released. So fear extinction is carried out here. And the last two, eight and nine, are being in touch with intuition. Um, this area of the brain is the part of the brain that actually receives input from the neural networks around the heart, which are very extensive, and the intestine. So when we say you have a gut reaction to something, we're not joking. It's not just a metaphor. It looks like it's a mechanism, a neural mechanism whereby the neural nets from the body especially the intestine and the heart, actually register in this part of the brain. So when you have a gut feeling or your heart is aching, it's literally aching. You know, and I could tell you all sorts of clinical stories about how this metaphor seen as a mechanism can help you move people uh, through pain and, and grief. And the final thing that I, if that list wasn't long enough as it is, is morality. That children who have tumors in this region when they grow up are amoral. Not immoral, but they just don't consider moral issues. Now you might say, that's pretty weird. Why would such an amazing list of nine things be a part of this one region of the brain? Well, this puzzled me, but when you look at how it is on the hand model, it turns out that's exactly how it is in the brain itself. Take a look at these middle two fingernails, okay, right here, in your brain model. Lift your fingers up and put them back down and lift them up and put it back down. What do you notice is unique about that region of the brain in your hand model? The amount of contact it has with, all with all the other areas. That's a beautiful way of saying it. And in fact, that is what is unique about it. This part of the brain integrates the differentiated circuits of the brain into one whole system. And so when you look at something called, uh, com yeah, what about telepathic abilities or psychic, telepathic or... Te telepathy and psychic abilities. Yeah. You know, I did have the opportunity to meet with a psychic, and uh, we had a couple of dinners together. And I, she was telling me what she did, and I told her about a, a system of neurons called the mirror neuron system, which could explain almost everything she experienced. That's one psychic, so I can't say all about telepathy or psych psychicness, but for her, Understanding the mirror neurons, which I'll tell you in a moment, helped her understand this feeling of intuition about what was going on in people that was so often true. But I, I'm not at all trying to say there's not something much more than that. I don't know. I'm not aware of, uh, there's probably a lot of people who study it. I'm not just aware of those studies. So the issue is when you have a part of the brain that connects directly to the entire brain, what does that allow those synaptic connections to do? It allows them to take the differentiated components of the brain and bring them together as a functional whole. And how many of you are familiar with complexity theory? Okay, so you may know from complexity theory that complexity theory states that when you take differentiated elements of a system and integrate them together, the system becomes the most complex. It's able to move toward complexity. Right? And when something moves toward complexity, it's the most flexible, adaptive, and stable, which is exactly what those nine things do. So in the developing mind, what I do is I apply complexity theory to neuroanatomy to understand relationships so that people can achieve deeper states of well-being within families. And the idea there is when you look at this notion, you see that integrating the brain allows for well-being to occur. So the general principle is this. Relationships between parents and children, for example, that are what are called secure or develop secure attachment are ultimately, I believe, promoting neural integration. 
And if you look just as a side issue, I mean, this is something that came out after this book was published, but if you look at studies that have come out to look at what child abuse does, fundamentally, what child abuse does to the brain, and this is straight out of, if you look at a paper from the Scientific American in March of 2002 by Martin Teicher at Harvard, he was summarizing all the studies to date that were done, and his conclusion is this. Child abuse destroys integrative fibers in the brain. And he says, healthy relationships probably promote integration. So you see that the extreme in the other direction, it seems to be also true. That when you see people who are not functioning in a flexible, adaptive, stable way, it's likely because the balance of integration and differentiation is not being achieved. So, let's go back to our example of going to the Oregon coast. Now we have the whole brain here. What was that like when you heard the second music? What did that feel like to you? Just the music part when you focus on that. It was scary. Jaws. Right? I've played this for people who've never heard Jaws, and the music seems to do the same thing, but that's probably why John Williams did that. Anyway, you know, certain, now why music evokes certain emotional states, I have no idea. Uh, and that's a fascinating question just by itself, but I don't know if anyone knows. But there seems to be something in the auditory input into the ears, and the tempo of it, the intensity of it, the rhythm of it, that somehow activates the fear state in the amygdala. Maybe it's the heart, the sense of a heart beating or that, that resonates and gets your heart beating. I don't know if anyone knows, but we do know that it does create a state of fear. Now, I just want to walk you through this because what we have, what I've described to you is the cortex with its higher abstract processing and this middle aspect of the prefrontal region which integrates the whole thing together. Let's watch how input from one area can change everything. Now you have the, the sound coming in and the amygdala sends off a signal this is really dangerous. Something bad is about to happen. Now, as far as we know, the way that works is the amygdala, which generates fear, is now going to send input throughout the brain. It's going to send its signals all around the brain. For example, it will activate the brain stem. So you start feeling like you could be in danger of your life, and you might choose to fight. You might choose to flee. You might choose to freeze, depending on your temperament and your, your own attachment history and, and experiences in your life. It will also start influencing your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, remember, the side area that allows you to be aware of the sensation of fear. And suddenly, not only are you feeling fear, which is one thing, but you're aware of feeling fear. Now what we know, just to give you a little, just a, a little highlight of how this works, the amygdala has been shown by Joe Ledoux and others to be able to hijack the perceptual input process. So let me give you an example. If I've been bitten by a cat when I was, let's say, six months of age, and now I'm 20 years of age, and I see a cat, OK? And I've never worked through the, the, anything about the cat. I just still have the fear. I'm lying on a couch, let's say, with my girlfriend, and a cat come, her cat jumps on the, on the thing, on the couch. And I look at the cat, this cute little cat. But for me, what is my amygdala going to do? Yo, that's dangerous, gets influenced by my brain stem, starts sending out signals. What we know is the amygdala will take over my eyes, literally. It will make me look not at the cute little furry cat, but at that cat's mouth. Let's say I was bitten by a cat. And then pretty soon, within a second or two, I'm not only focusing on the mouth, I'm focusing on the teeth. And as you probably know, if you take your eyes and, and focus your attention on one aspect of things, how does it appear in your subjective visual field? Larger. Larger. And pretty soon, my experience there sitting with my girlfriend is that this lion has jumped on the couch, and I'm about to be swallowed, and I have a panic attack. Right? We know the amygdala is perfectly capable of shaping perception. So how many of you could feel your body get a little frightened in the second phase of that film? Right? You know, that's how the amygdala works. It isn't your cortex running the show. It's your entire brain coming up with a brain state. And so this raises the, the fourth or fifth take home point, which is that what we're talking about is not so much our thinking controlling our lives, but the state of activation of our brain, which is called a state of mind. And so when we talk about what you do here at Microsoft 
and ways you're approaching, let's say, user interface changes or ways of making the programs uh, more uh, enjoyable or more efficient or where you get into a nice streaming experience or a flow with things, you're really talking about a brain state, an overall state of mind created by brain activation in which I would suggest to you, you might want to look at the way the brain becomes integrated as a whole. Because in this state of fear, what it looks like is the brain is becoming disintegrated. And emotional experience actually can be seen as the way you bring everything together, whatever you happen to be focusing on. Yeah? In the case of music, for instance, perception, is it considered as a universal? Like whether, you know, say I'm Japanese and then, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, we kind of perceive the second music sad or right. scary. And right. Like, we never teach kids, okay, this is a sad music. No, I know. It's a great question. You know, at our Center for Culture, Brain, and Development, we're always asking questions like that, looking for the universal that may be embedded in our genes that creates the initial structure of our brains. Um, so I was able actually to show this in Japan to a number of people who, who said they never saw Jaws, and they had an equally frightening experience with that music. So, I mean, I was actually there teaching. Um, but on the other hand, certain other things also are shaped by our experience. Yes. So for, for me with, a, with the cat, other people would just love the cat. Yeah, so, I understand the visual case, you know, you experience and then you kind of learn. Yeah. But in the case of music, it was kind of yeah, mystery well, too. Yeah, people have, I think, different associations. I mean, you know, if you've had a positive experience with certain kinds of music, I think you'll have a very positive state of mind. If, you were, uh, if it wasn't that way for you, it'll evoke a different state of mind. So I think both are true. There are some universal impacts of music, and it may have more to do with our physiology uh, than our experience. Yeah. I was going to say, just sort of following on from what Takaba was saying. Um, in the case of the music, it must, in trying to do a cross cultural study, um, one of the difficulties I imagine is trying to control for the fact that people are exposed to large numbers of music, movies. For example, yeah. that kind of music. The the issue, I, I think, is yes, the music does uh, trigger the, the, these emotions. But how much of that component is actually is actually culturally induced by the experience? Absolutely. No, it's a good question. And I, I'm not a ethnomusicologist, so I, I don't know how they would tease that apart. I know I, this is embarrassing to say, but I never saw Jaws the first time I saw this. Uh, and it scared me. And I've never seen Jaws. So, um, uh, and I think that's how composers who are doing this kind of thing to match the, to try to enhance the music, enhance the mood with their music, they must be in touch with this kind of process. But if you look you know, at uh, animal cries and bird cries, there are absolutely with states of arousal, calm, fear, and so on. Yeah, so the point is we make it in, in birds and other animals, there are these universals. And there's probably something we've just inherited over millions and millions of years of evolution where sound has a certain impact on these states. You know, um, certainly the sound, it's universal to, to have someone be quiet. You go, shh, which is thought to reflect the sound of the rushing blood through the aorta and through the umbilical cord, you know, where this baby is hearing this shh, 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 and it just brings, you just try that with a baby, it just, they just kind of start getting to a trance. Now, let me bring up two other issues uh, that I think are, are very important, and that's the idea of how does experience shape this brain? Okay, so we've mentioned in terms of this walk to the Oregon coast, your experience will affect that. If you've walked to a coast in general and you've had wonderful experience, it might be positive. If you've had bad experience, it might be negative without any sound. But how does experience change the, the mind and change the brain? Well, the study of memory yields uh, incredible insights into that. And let me just give you the take-home points. The first broadest take-home point is that when neurons fire, they can rewire, OK? Neurons which fire together are thought to wire together is a principle from Donald Hebb from 1949. And everything that's come up in brain science has pretty much established that that's true. In fact, Eric Kandel won the Nobel Prize for that in 2000, showing that when this electrical current goes down the axonal length and neurotransmitters are released, the DNA in the presynaptic cells activated 
And when DNA is activated, you, you produce proteins, which ultimately can change the, the connections among neurons. So really what we're talking about is that experience turns on genes so that proteins can be made so new structure can be created. So experience, for it to have a lasting impact on the brain, changes brain connectivity. And that's not a controversial issue, that's for sure. Now you can say, what allows that to happen? Well, certain kinds of memory require conscious attention, and other kinds don't. And emotion, it turns out, emotional arousal enhances neuroplasticity, that is, enhances the creation of new neural connections. So in psychotherapy, for example, in the school where I teach, you know, it isn't just that we want people to have an emotional catharsis or an emotional experience just for the heck of it. I believe that for any form of psychotherapy to work, it's got to change the brain. And we know that the arousal of emotion with intolerable levels allows neuroplasticity to be enhanced. And so you greatly increase your chance of having a positive result of changing the person's brain if you can have emotions be a part of that experience in a positive way. So that's the most general take home point. But you might want to know, because you work in the computer user interface world, that in fact, the kind of memory that happens has a, a trajectory. And I want to just give you the overview of it because I think it's worth knowing about. The first general broad stroke is that there are two processing systems in the brain that are quite different. One is called implicit memory, and the other is called explicit memory. And I'm going to walk you through each one so you can get a feeling for it. Implicit memory is the way the brain takes in the sensations from hearing and, and sight and um, a smell, touch. All the five senses come into the brain and they activate these neural firing patterns and they lay down neural maps for an experience. So like when I was six months of age, if I was bitten by a cat, I'll remember what the cat looked like implicitly. I'll feel the bite on my finger implicitly. I'll have the smell of the cat. I'll even feel my own fear. So I'll have the perception, the emotional response, the bodily reaction, and the behavioral impulse, like to run away, let's say. And those four things, perception, emotion, bodily sensation, and behavioral reaction are the fundamental building blocks of what is called implicit memory. And we're always laying these down, but the important issue is that before the age of about a year and a half, it's all that we lay down because we don't have the second part of the brain called the hippocampus here to allow for the second form, explicit memory, to occur. The two other parts of implicit memory are that it primes, priming or getting the brain ready to respond in a certain way is part of implicit memory and mental models or the way this brain makes generalizations of repeated experiences are um, part of implicit memory. Now, here's the deal. When implicit memory is being laid down, you don't need to pay any attention. It's weird, but you don't. And that has serious implications for trauma and psychotherapy that we won't get into. But you don't need to pay attention. Yeah? Is that why we don't remember previous age, you know, before age of five? Or exactly. Six, four? That's exactly you why. Don't have that explicit memory. Yeah, That's okay. right. No it's one has. It's, it's not possible to remember explicitly before two, for sure. Although, I must tell you, I have one patient who remembers coming out of the birth canal, and I had him tested. He has the most developed hippocampus anyone has ever seen. And he probably was an unusual situation where his hippocampus just happened to be really developed in utero. You know, I, I could go on about his story, but I won't, I won't <laughs> go on with that. But, I mean, it's an amazing person. I mean, so when we make statements like that, we're talking about broad strokes, and there are always exceptions, and, and they could really be true, that someone could have a well-developed hippocampus in utero and just remember it. Memory starts around six, seven months of age, implicitly, in utero. So, like, I did some tests with my kids, where I sang to them certain songs, and then I had a, a, a person there um, afterwards when I sang the songs to them later um, so that they could see if the kids recognized them, and they did. Anyway, um, okay, so that's implicit memory. But here are the two key, key points. You don't have to pay attention when you're encoding it, and when you reactivate an implicit-only memory, like when I'm sitting on the couch, because remember, I, the, the cat bit me when I was six months of age. Now I'm 20, I'm with my girlfriend, I'm on the couch, the cat jumps on there. I'm having an implicit-only activation. Here's the crucial issue. When you retrieve an implicit memory like that, when it's reactivated, you have no sensation that it's coming from the past. It just shapes your here and now experience. 
So it's not that it's unconscious, it's just that it isn't tagged with I am remembering something. See? And this can explain a lot, if not almost everything, about post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay. Now, the second form of memory begins about a year and a half in age when areas of this hippocampus begin to develop. And when that occurs, there's two elements of explicit memory we need to talk about. The first is to think of the hippocampus as the master puzzle piece assembler. Implicit memory, as we've described it, are the puzzle pieces of memory. They're scattered around of your, your behaviors, your emotions, your perceptions, your bodily sensations, your priming, your, your mental models, all in there without assemblage. But once the hippocampus comes online, the first stage is it creates what's called episodic memory. That is, ep an, you in an episode of an experience at some time. Okay? So it, it creates an episode of lived experience. Around the same time, it's creating what's called semantic memory or memory for a fact. Those two things, semantic or factual memory and episodic memory, can begin around a year and a half of age. But then when the child gets to be anywhere from three to five, which is what you're talking about, this prefrontal area begins to mature and work in conjunction with the hippocampus to take those episodes of lived experience and assemble them together into what's called autobiographical memory. And that's basically tying those single pictures together in kind of like a slideshow, right? That's autobiographical memory. And then as we get a little bit older even, this autonoetic consciousness business, we then develop the next aspect of explicit memory, which is called autobiographical narrative. We actually develop a narrator in our heads that develops themes about our lives, categories of times, things that happen to us. And then we extract from autobiographical memory different categorizations, like doing a search with a search engine. Okay. And that's basically the pathway of memory from sensation to life story. Now, here's the issue for, for computers. You know, if someone's paying attention with their dorsolateral prefrontal cortex to what you're presenting on the screen or auditorily, they're going to be putting that into explicit memory. But there's so much that goes on in the screen, you can be sure it's being encoded into implicit memory, too. So part of when we talk about getting in the flow of a process would be to understand what the brain of this subject that you're looking at, the user, is able to actually pay attention to and how that matches or doesn't match with the elements that they're not able to pay attention to. Because ultimately, um, the time when the hippocampus then takes those elements that it didn't pay attention to during the day, or even the ones that it did, and assembles them together is during dreams. That's right. In something called cortical consolidation. The hippocampus works overtime when we sleep to try to reorganize all the emotions, all the experiences, implicit and explicit that have been laid down, and put them into the cortex in some kind of framework that we, is a part of our life narrative. That's called cortical consolidation. And here are a couple of interesting take-home issues. The first is that we now know, as of the last three years, that the hippocampus as well as other areas, but this is the most studied, has stem cells in it. Stem cells are uncommitted cells, cells that can grow into full-grown neurons. So not only do we make new connections among existing neurons, we now know that the hippocampus every day has a division of a daughter cell into, it is a stem cell into a daughter cell and the continuing stem cell. If experiences are considered novel, and this again reaches into what you can do with the interface thing, if you experience something as novel, it will stimulate that hippocampal cell to go from just a daughter cell that would just wither away to a daughter cell that begins to integrate itself into the entire system. These are very integrative uh, cells. And by the end, this is the work of uh, uh, Rusty Gage, by the end of about a month, it can be seen as a as existing within this complex network. And by the end of three months, it's a fully matured neuron. So this process of actually taking information, consolidating it, and putting it into new integrative structures in the brain looks like it can happen not only with new connections, which can be almost instantaneous that you can make them, but it can happen over about a three-month period. So in terms of your user interface, that's another thing to think about is how can novelty be uh, introduced enough 
to actually keep the experience fresh so that you're stimulating these daughter cells to grow into full-on integrated fibers. The last thing I just want to say is, is this, is that because we now know that the brain is able to grow new neural connections throughout the lifespan, and even new neurons, it looks like, throughout the lifespan, there's every reason to believe that with the proper experiences, you can keep the brain and its related mind actually very young. And so some of the new approaches to preventing dementia, as you may know, are to keep the brain stimulated. One of the opposites of stimulation is boredom and routine. And so I think with computers, the way you have helped them become, there is a way now to actually introduce something in the daily life of people, let's say in retirement homes, that will keep them learning new things. I mean, people can learn foreign languages. They can can be challenged all the time, not so it's overwhelming, not so they feel incompetent, but rather where they feel stimulated and alive. And to get these new connections to maintain themselves and to perhaps stimulate these new neurons to continue to grow. That's true not only with knowledge, but it's also true with emotional growth. I have someone in his 90s now, mid-90s, who has come for the first time for psychotherapy. Can you imagine that? And because um, he's realizing he's getting older. Um, and he had some issues, I won't go into the details for confidentiality reasons, but he had some issues that we needed to work on. And um, so we began to work on them. And sure enough, his entire sense of himself, his, he used to be very down on himself, but now he's, he's become very positive towards himself. And his relationships with others in his life, his kids and his wife, have start, started to transform in his mid-90s. So you might say, that's too weird, that's too weird. But if you really know that the brain can grow these new connections, and especially it has a natural push to integrate itself, then finding ways, whether it's through psychotherapy or through technology, to keep this brain alive and stimulated and integrating can really help people lead fuller lives. So let me thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. But do you think that body learning could have the same effect? Like, I know maybe they're 90 years old, they can't do somersaults and something, but just leaving that out of it. If you taught them Russian dance or something they'd never done or something with their body before, would you expect that to have a similar effect on keeping the brain young? Yeah. Uh, two, two parts to that question. It's a great question. One is absolutely, if people should be engaged, the body is very much a part of the mind, right? You know, for sure. And so we, need, we can't just think about cognitive things. and. Um, we didn't get to one thing, which I'll just show you, because it really raises the important issue. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Hold on. Um, maybe it's here. I want to show you. No, it's not here. But actually, let me just go out of this for a moment and show you this here. Because the brain actually has. Um, a left and a right side. And the right side is very much integrated with the body, much more than the left. So the, the left is our logical, linear, linguistic-based, usually what we think of as the uh, thinking brain. The right side, in contrast, is very much a visceral part of the brain. It has an integrated map of the whole body. It's very emotional. It's holistic. Um, it actually uh, is more connected to raw emotions and empathy. And so when you talk about the body, I, I think about developing this right cortical area. So absolutely, body is very important. But the other side of the question, in fact, is that if you have an athlete, let's say, who's been injured, and you say to the athlete, look, you're injured, you, you know, you're going to be playing in a month. You know, what should you do in this month? You can't go on the court. If you have them use their mind to imagine practicing and shooting hoops, they actually do as well as if they had the month of practice. So ultimately, it comes down to what you're focusing your brain on that changes the connections in the brain. So the mind focus can happen when you're moving your body, or mind focus can happen when you're using your imagination. And it looks like both are really good. You also want to get all of us up and out because we sit too much. You know, that's a good thing anyway. Yeah? So is it mind focus, or is it knowledge experiences that causes this? Because there have been studies with, um, I think it was nuns, where they followed them 
nuns that actually kept diaries have much were much less likely to have dementia um, as they got older, and so they think that it's the writing and keeping your mind fresh in that exercise. But that isn't a new experience. That's really just sort of using what you have. Well, that's a really interesting question. Um, my reading of the nun study uh, had an additional component, which is that the nuns who wrote a lot about themselves in elaborate ways when they were teenagers, compared to the nuns who wrote in like a sentence or two about themselves, uh, the latter developed dementia, the former who wrote a lot did not. So it may be that they were, they were already set with a lot of connections. But my experience personally and also professionally with journal writing is that it's anything but routine. It's not something you already know how to do, that you're using your medial prefrontal area to constantly elaborate a new autobiographical story of yourself. So actually journal writing is the opposite of routine. And so if people are doing that, it may be that it's not just that they had been motivated to do it, it may be that doing that is preventative. And that's what we're hoping for, and, I, and, and the studies are out now, but we'll, we'll see. I mean, geriatric psychiatrists are firm believers that you need to have the self-reflective, new involvement, and not just, you know, thinking about yourself in the same old ways, but in new ways. Yeah, so that's a good point. Yeah. Oh, um, you mentioned uh, in passing smell when you talked about uh, auditory stimulus. Can you, do you have anything else you could kind of say about smell, about the olfactory? Well, smell, olfactory. I don't know that much about smell except it goes straight into the brain. It's one of the only okay. senses that goes without passing through the thalamus, right. you know, which is like a filter for perception. And so in that way, it has a direct impact on our memories and our moods and, and that kind of thing. Other than that, I mean, I think the person just got the Nobel Prize for smell here in Seattle, right? So I, I haven't read her work, but um, there's probably a huge, obviously, there's a huge amount about smell, and I just, I'm not familiar with that, that research literature. Yeah? So I was wondering what makes your autobiographical memory more intact? Would it be more connections and integration, which might cause more competition for the quote-unquote truth, or would it be less integration, but more intact bits? Now, this is a great question, and believe it or not, that question is the topic of my next two-day talk. Oh. <laughs> of course. <laughs> At Seattle Center um, tomorrow and Saturday. Uh, you know, um, because that is the ultimate question for a therapist. Yeah. You know, is what is it all about? And, what, you know, um, in the blue book there, The Developing Mind, what I talk about is how uh, certain attachment experiences impair the ability to have any autobiographical memory. And the narratives of those individuals, about 20% of the population, is incredibly impoverished. And uh, as a researcher in attachment, it's a, it's a fascinating finding. As a clinician now working for over a dozen years with these individuals, I can tell you they can't develop an autobiographical narrative of their childhood that's detailed. But what they can do as adults is develop the capacity for autobiographical narrative now in their adulthood about their present life and what's going on from here forward. So I think there's actually, we, we didn't really talk about it, but autobiographical memory is almost exclusively encoded in a nonverbal form in the right hemisphere. But when you tell an autobiographical narrative, you're using the left hemisphere to access through this, this, band, of, uh, this band of neural tissue called the corpus callosum, you're actually using the logical, linear, linguistic-based um, left hemisphere, which is thought to have a drive for storytelling, to actually reach across and pull out data that's in this side of the brain. So in, in the developing mind, that the blue book, I, you know, I talk about how I believe that these individuals, this 20% of the population who grew up in an emotional desert, basically, they have had um, an impairment in the integration of their left and right hemispheres in addition to other impairments. And that what happens when they're adults when you study their narratives, is you say, for example, tell me about your childhood. And they go, what do you mean? You go, well, what was your childhood like? They go, it was good. And well, you say, give me an example. They go, I don't know what you mean. Well, give me an example of what good was. Well, it was good because my mother was good. It's this very, you, you say, well, there, there are detail. And there's a feeling like they know logically what they're supposed to say, like good life or whatever. They use words perfectly logically. And in fact, studies have shown their memory is perfectly intact for facts, which are actually stored in the left hemisphere. But when they go for autobiographical stuff, they can't get it. And they can't get it, 
I believe, now that I've done this therapy with so many of these people, they can't get it because it's not there. It was never encoded. Now, when you haven't encoded it, what that means is you don't have this rich, in Tolving's terms, autonoetic sense. You don't have much mental time travel. You don't really have much experience visiting who you are and what that means and themes of your life. And so in working in therapy with these people, what I do is I help them develop, number one, the connections in their right hemisphere, because I think it's massively underdeveloped. And then I help them develop the link between their left and their right. And then once they do that, lo and behold, they become empathic, emotionally tuned in, connected people. And I get so many thank yous from their spouses because being married to someone who's disconnected like that, it feels very disconnecting. And, and they're, usually on the, they're usually on the verge of divorce because the person doesn't, hasn't learned how to connect to other people because you really need to have an integrated brain to make an integrated relationship. Yeah? Uh, you mentioned at the beginning that there's a part of the brain that are only found in reptiles. Then no, no, no. First found in reptiles. First found in reptiles. Yeah, not only. No, no, no. Okay, okay. We, we're always building on top of right. that. Right. Then you build on top to mammals. Then yeah. you build on top to um, primates. And I was wondering... Oh, and I got to mention mirror neurons. You're reminding me of mirror neurons. So I got to... Mm -hmm. So the two questions I have is first, like, are there any scientific predictions of what's coming next on top? Yeah. And the second one is... A big computer. <laughs> the, the second one is, like... Have the experiments found sections of the brain that they never turn on? Like, you can't get the person to think or do anything that will turn on a certain section of the brain. Or is it all responsible? Yeah, the brain works as a system. And in fact, what's interesting about it is it, it's really like a, comp I'll do the second part first and the first part last. Okay. It's like a competitive real estate market, okay? In the following sense. If you, um, if you uh, uh, have someone who's born with cataracts, okay, and they severe ca cataracts, they don't have light input to their visual cortex. All right, what happens is the input from the ears and from the skin, touch and sound, take over the visual cortex. Nothing is left untouched. That's what I mean a competitive real estate market. You don't see any empty lots around in the brain. You know, the input says, "Where can I grab it? Where can I grab it?" Let me give you a, an amazing example. You can have people who've uh, let's say they have a paralyzed right arm because they have a stroke in their left hand, uh, left brain, okay? Crosses over. And you can take them, even sometimes up to a decade or more after their stroke, and so I'm able to do things, but I can't move my right hand. You can strap this hand down, and with some intensive eight-week treatment, you can get them to start using their right hand because it starts using the old, the real, the real estate that's still working. It was easier to do this because the connection was still there, so it kept on competing for it and maintaining it, maintaining it, so this one's like dead, but you can get it to start working. So we are beginning to realize that the brain is incredibly dynamic. And so how you do that, how you stimulate the area, so it isn't that their area is not working. It is probably true that the potential of the brain is untapped because, why? You know, with the hundreds of trillions of connections, there must be a good mathematician in the room, how many on-off firing patterns are there in the brain? Well, there are more on-off firing patterns in the brain than there are known particles in the universe. Okay, it's virtually infinite. So this thing in our skulls is thought to be the most complex entity in the universe. Now, there are two things, three things about it I just want to say. First of all, the brain doesn't appear to have changed much in the last 40,000 years. Okay, what has taken over from biological evolution where genes are altered, et cetera, et cetera, is cultural evolution. Culture is the transmission of information through uh, objects and through means of uh, behavior. Uh, and through culture, of course, we've changed tremendously. You know, Microsoft has changed the culture of this planet. There's no question about that. So in terms of your issue of what's going to happen next, you know, because cultural evolution has so rapidly uh, um, um, accelerated, you know, that's going to be where we have to watch things. Now, the bad news about that is we have the, we're, we're living with ancient brain systems in a culture that may not be able to handle that, and, and we really don't know how long we're going to still exist on the planet, given how fast technology is developing weapons of mass destruction, et cetera. 
and pollution and everything like that. So we really, it isn't really, I think it's, it's, it's not clear if we're going to survive for that very reason. We've got ancient brains, advanced technology, the, the match doesn't really work too well. The good side of that is because we are thinking creatures, maybe we can intelligently influence what we do with our culture. And so that's part of the, the, the books that I'm writing, or, you know, trying to say, okay, well, let's not just be passive about it. Maybe we can say, look, we need to really do some things if we're going to survive. And if you have kids, no, you always get that feeling inside. You go, Jesus, what's happening to this planet? Can't we make this a better place to be, let alone let's make this a place to be? You know, so I think there's some work, if we're conscious, that we can fight some of the, the trends. Now, let me just offer two other things, because uh, I keep on mentioning I want to bring them up. One is mirror neurons. You know, th these are an incredible uh, set of neurons that relate to the second thing, so I'll weave them together, which is all about something called mind sight, or the, be able, the ability to see other people's minds. Mirror neurons were discovered 10 years ago in monkeys, and they were discovered uh, in human beings about five years ago. And the person who definitively showed them is a guy I work with here, uh, here in the United States, uh, UCLA, named Marco Iacoboni. And basically what these neurons are, are they're neurons in the, remember, here's the, 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 here's the front of the head, here's the frontal sulcus, so here's the frontal lobe, and here's where you have all your perceptual systems here, basically. This is the outer cortex. And here you have your motor strip, your premotor area. So, a researcher had an electrode in a neuron in the motor area, okay, looking for motor activity. And one day, he noticed that this was active when a monkey was picking up a peanut. Okay? And when the researcher came and picked up a peanut, the same exact neuron became activated when the monkey just watched him pick up the peanut. This was a really incredible thing, because what it meant was that a motor neuron responded to a perception. Okay, now that right away is pretty fascinating. And you can see, in fact, when you look at the six layers, the, the, the neocortex has six layers in it. And Hawkins has wrote a book called On Intelligence, which is an interesting uh, thing you can look at, but that describes this in a, in a very clear way. But the bottom line is the six cellular layer as a way where the perceptual system actually has axons at one of the layers that goes directly to the motor system. So that we understand there's a neural mechanism why perception and motor action should be linked, in fact, and, and the, these mirror neurons show that they are. But here's the important issue. Mirror neurons don't respond just to any old action. So if I go like this to you, like this, I can tell you your mirror neurons are not being activated. In fact, we did a fun study with the research group, a mirror neuron study, and they weren't activated very much. But if I go like this, Right? Watch me. I know inside of you, and we just did the study, you're going to have a much bigger activation because your, your motor neurons are going to do two things. They're going to basically detect intention inside of me. They're going to detect intention, number one, so that at some level of information processing, they've already decoded, probably from experience, of watching people drink from cups and you drinking from cups. They know drinking from a cup is an act with intention behind it. And so they get active with intention. But the other thing is that they prime your brain to take a drink. That's probably why when people yawn, other people yawn. OK? So it's priming you to, get to take a drink. Now, mirror neurons are an incredible uh, finding that help us understand the basis for empathy. And how does that happen? Well, Marco Iacoboni has proposed that though these motor neurons, which are mirror neurons, have mirror properties, are on the outside of the brain, there's an area of the brain called the insula, which takes the information gathered from this outer area and brings it to the limbic system. And what he was able to show in some preliminary studies through the insula hypothesis um, paradigm was that when you see an emotion on someone else, you create it in yourself, right? So in terms of what Microsoft can do, the opportunity is there to actually try to generate experiences, faces and all sorts of things that go on, where people can start becoming aware of their own bodily reaction, their emotional response. Now, here's the deal, and, and oh, I won't go into the slides. I have, I have all of Marco's research slides, but let me just show you just with this pointer. What, what we now know happens is this, and there have been a lot of studies then to prove this is true. 
the, the few studies we now have then are on the mirror neuron system. You watch someone with your perceptual system have an emotion. It goes to your limbic areas here. That then seems to be monitored, as we've said, by the middle area of the prefrontal cortex. So the limbic response gives you what you can call emotional attunement or resonance. That's not empathy. That's maybe compassion. You feel with another person. That's very important, step number one. But the next step is this middle part of the prefrontal cortex examines what your body is doing, what your limbic areas are doing, and it has this, what's called interoception. It examines what's going on internally, and then it has to make an interpretation of what that means. Oh, I must be sad. And then it does a third thing, which it makes an attribution. It says, my body and my face are showing sadness. This must be, I'm going to attribute it to what's going on in the other person. And that, we believe, is the neural mechanism for empathy. It allows us to have mind sight, to see another person's mind. Now, so many kids these days are not having this. And if you lack empathy, you can just go out and shoot someone because you want their car. Why not? They got a car, you don't have a car, why not shoot them? Right? If you lack mind sight, you treat other people like objects. So whatever we can do in our culture, in terms of the question about cultural evolution, to actually promote mind sight, to promote empathy, can continue to make our life with each other as this huge socially interconnected culture that we have, this global culture, a more prosperous and healthy place to live. So you tell me the time. I can go on for hours. So I'm happy to take more questions. But you, I, want, I want a timekeeper to give me the boundaries. So why don't we take one more question? Okay, well, there are two. Can I do two? Well, sure. Okay. Because <laughs> I saw two hands. You only saw one, so you said one. We'll do two. So do you, there and there. Do you think that promotion of mind sight, besides kicking kids off computers, when they're on a computer, do you think there's something that can be done in a synthetic 3D animation? I do. Way to I simulate human interaction? I actually do think there is. I actually have designed a, a, a computer-based way of, of promoting MindSight um, because I believe deeply, and I've worked with, I have, I have like a, a, a group that's been working trying to figure out how can you, you can't fight computers and kids. I mean, I have two kids. I know it's impossible. So if we can get in there and actually create a system that can use that interface of a screen and sound with kids, I think there is a way to do that. Absolutely, I think there is. If you look at the kind of games that are there now, and I, I do have to show you this one set of slides here. If you look at, um, where did it go? Uh, let me just grab it off here for a second. That's my daughter, by the way. Uh, let's see. Yeah. If you look at this kind of study, you can see here, here's a kid playing a game. Uh, I don't know, you know, actually this isn't a game, this is just watching this fight, but there is a game, there, there are studies, lots of studies now, where kids watch these fighting games, okay? And what happens is, I just want to show you when you look at this area of the brain, look how much of the medial prefrontal area is activated. Zippo. Those are really amygdala-driven, posterior, you know, processing things. We can design stuff to activate the medial prefrontal region. And remember, when it's activated, it grows. These games don't do anything for that. And I think there's absolutely a way where you can do that. I, 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 once you know how to do it, you could do it. The, the trick is, how do you make it appealing to kids? So since we have a whole bunch, all the people that I work with now, we have these kids, we're trying to figure out a way to shape it up so they'll be interested. But this activates nothing in what we're trying to promote. Yeah, one more question. So mind sight must have this side where it goes too high also. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. This, uh, this, my next book is called Mind Sight, and you can look at the lens sometimes as being opaque, like in those individuals who were, had a difficult childhood where they, people didn't see their minds, and so they didn't develop a way to see their own minds or minds of other people. That's like an opaque lens. You can also have a lens which is hyper-focused, especially if, you, if either from your temperament, you know, either your genetic or early experiences shape you constitutionally, we call it temperament, or your, um, your, your experiences later on, your, the way you've adapted to attachment experiences, you can have a hyper-focused lens. Um, and so you can be extremely sensitive to people's every move and over-interpret those things and jump to conclusions, for sure. 
There's even um, a group of people, uh, I've been studying this in a different kind of setting, um, trying to look at the relationship between uh, genetic issues like in temperament uh, with attachment issues that we've been talking about and how adult personality develops. I was able to s spend some time with about 50 people looking at this. And I'm writing a paper with some people at NIH on this. Um, you could actually make the hypothesis that some people have got a huge amount of mirror neurons. And so with that hypothesis, I was able to test these different groups and find, in fact, this one group was incredibly focused. So if you're walking around, like I have a little kid I work with now in my office, he's obviously loaded like crazy with mirror neurons, you know, unlike others of us. But he's like, look, so you just wince and he's like, you know, his whole body reacts. His mother says when he goes down the street and there's a homeless person, he's, he's affected for about two or three hours. It just fills him. And in school, you know, he's so connected to other people and he's so filled with all this stuff that people just, you know, can, can feel, yeah, he's like that. So someone with a huge amount of mirror neurons, that's just to be simple about it. Yeah, they're going to be embedding in um, their medial prefrontal area, just to go back there. Um, let's see where it is. Uh, they're going to be, uh, here we go. They're going to be, um, in this zone, going to be filled with all sorts of stuff that will be difficult for them to distinguish what's me, what's other people, and they'll become hyper-focused on that. It raises one more issue, and then I know we've got to stop. Let me just show you this one thing. This has been really something to see this. Remember those nine things of the medial prefrontal area, the middle part of the prefrontal cortex we talked about? Well, it turns out that sometimes parents, or any of us really, can get so much activation in the limbic area that it shuts off the middle prefrontal cortex. And in the Parenting from the Inside Out, of actually both books, I talk about this. And when you shut this off, you enter a temporary state of insanity. You actually have lost your mind. You've gone down what I call the low road. And when you're down the low road, if you look at that list of nine, any of those list of nine can be offline. Never All right? happened no, right. not, not for you. That never happened to me, ever. <laughs> but in the parenting book, I actually talk about a number of my low road experiences because this is a normal human finding. But what happens if you don't make a repair with your children is that the children are left absolutely confused. And if it happens over and over again, it can be quite traumatizing and then happen to the next generation. So ironically, actually, by understanding the mechanisms in the brain for how we lose our mind and then find them again, parents have been able to develop more compassion first toward themselves to understand this is just something going on in their brains. And somehow, when they can see it happening in their brains, it distances them enough, they get compassion toward themselves, that they can then overcome any pride they have or feelings of shame and go to their child and say, you know something? I made a mistake. I lost my mind. You know, this is what happened. I really shouldn't do that. And I'm going to really work on not having that happen in the future. It happens to all of us. The crucial thing is making repair so kids can really feel loved and feel like they can make sense of their lives. So let me thank you for your attention. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you.